So good afternoon, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Noah Gordon, and I co-direct the Sustainability, Climate, and Geopolitics program here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Book events like this are some of the most fun parts of my job, but we do some other work that I should mention before we start. It's fun in different ways. We recently launched a podcast called Barbecue Earth, um, which is about animal agriculture. It seems to be the most under-discussed driver of climate crisis by both policymakers and the public. So it's a tour from... Uh, cattle laundering in Brazil, to a farmer's revolt in the Netherlands, to lab-grown meat in California. And if you like Akshat's podcast, Zero, you may like ours as well, so check that and out. I have listened to it, so I would recommend it. See, a recommendation right there. And just yesterday, we kicked off a major task force titled Foreign Policy for Clean Energy. This initiative takes the same approach as the uh, previous Carnegie Endowment Task Force, Foreign Policy for the Middle Class, that informed the policy of the current Biden administration. But this time, our group of experts from both major U.S. parties are examining what actions U.S. foreign policymakers should take in 2025 to strengthen the global supply chains that will make U.S. decarbonization possible. But you're not here today to hear about any of that. Uh, I'm excited about today's event because we have a great journalist here to discuss a great book. The book is titled Climate Capitalism, Winning the Race to Zero Emissions and uh, Solving the Crisis of Our Age. It's been named one of the best books of the year by the Times, Economic Times, and the Kalinga Literary Festival. The journalist, the expert, the author, is Dr. Akshat Rati. Akshat is an award-winning, award London-based senior reporter for Bloomberg News and the host of the Zero podcast. Um, so Akshat, we, he and I will have a discussion about the book, and then we'll move to questions from you, the audience. Um, you can put the questions in the YouTube chat. You can raise your hand if you're here in the room, or you can use the QR codes on your seats to put them in now. And um, after that, we'll have a reception for the in-person crowd. The drinks and snacks are free. There's also books you can buy. Those are not free, but Akshat will sign them for you if you ask nicely. Without further delay, please welcome Akshat Rati. Hi. Akshat, let's start with the basics. Why did you write this book, and what's your main thesis? Yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me. This is a really fun event. Uh, and the reason to write the book I started uh, in 2019 was, as a journalist, my goal is to try and bridge the gap between reality and what people's perception of reality is. Um, and I was just seeing a big divide between big amount of uh, noise on the on, uh, activism side that nothing is working. We've had the Paris Agreement. Uh, none of the goals are being met. We are hitting new greenhouse gas emissions records, all factually correct things. Uh, and then the answer being the only way we're going to get any solution is to overthrow capitalism. Uh, and on the other side, I was seeing all these climate solutions starting to scale in all parts of the world, uh, all kinds of different solutions, and governments starting to uh, experiment with different ideas to try and deploy these solutions. So I just wanted to try and find out for myself where are successes on climate happening? If they are not, why not? And if they are, what are the ingredients that, that are making them happen? And that is what the book is about. It's quite an optimistic book, which I appreciate. You know, something we just talked about in the green room before this, we are off track on many climate metrics, most of them. But if you look at the very big picture, 10 years ago, the world was on track to warm by more than four degrees, and now it's on track to warm by less than three. So that's good and something to be encouraged about. Um, you know, the best stories are about people, and that's shown by the structure of your book. Let's start with a personal question. How did a guy with a PhD in organic chemistry from Oxford end up as one of the top climate journalists? <laughs> Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I, I feel like I'm, I'm only getting started on the climate beat. It's uh, such a fascinating beat. Um, I, it's a circuitous journey because you know a PhD in chemistry doesn't really help you in the climate world. Uh, but I used to write as a hobby uh, all through my undergrad and, and grad, stu uh, grad studies. And the world of ideas, being in un universities, uh, just was one that I didn't want to leave. Uh, and writing felt like the, the thing I could do. Journalism felt like the place I could be in the world of ideas. So uh, I started off as a science journalist because that's what my training allowed me to do. Uh, and it was Donald Trump. That was the reason I got into climate. So something we can thank Trump for. Um, and uh, he was talking about clean coal in his 2016 campaign. And my editor was like, what is he talking about? Uh, and it was basically he didn't understand it. But there was a real technology that was you know, flawed in many ways, but working in some places. Uh, and I ended up doing a series of stories looking at carbon capture technology. And that's how I got into writing about climate solutions and false solutions. Got it. You know, I think the new clean coal is uh, climate-friendly beef. That's the new thing we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. 
Um, you mentioned Trump, and we're here in Washington, D.C., so let's do something Americans often do and start with America first. <laughs> Uh, you say that Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement in 2017, but wasn't, quote, able to subdue the forces that were driving action. What are those forces that, that you know, uh, have an effect no matter what the government is doing? Yeah, and, and we can extend that a few years down, right? Uh, take the period uh, under Trump and then uh, the period uh, that we went through with a pandemic, with a post-pandemic, with high interest rates, uh, with supply chains breaking. And you look at the investment curves on clean energy investments, and they've just been going up and up. And I'll just quote three figures from the last three years. So 2021, 2022, 2023, the investments have been $1.1 trillion, $1.5 trillion, and $1.8 trillion. Uh, and so there are now, there's a clear understanding in businesses that climate risk is something that they have to consider. They may not always want to do something about it right now, but they're starting to think about it all the way up to the boardroom. Uh, the same thing is true of uh, governments with almost all the major economies having a net zero goal and many of them having legally binding targets that have been set for 2030 that they need to meet. Uh, and the awareness on climate has not gone down uh, mm -hmm. any bit, uh, despite there being some backpedaling in different parts of the world, despite there being some far-right politicians uh, being elected on sort of anti-climate uh, stances. The, the macro picture on people worried about climate wanting to do something about it hasn't gone away. That's very well said, and it makes me think about how it's often competition that drives climate action and not cooperation. I mean, Texas generates a lot more renewable electricity in California, and it's not because they consider the Paris Agreement sacrosanct or anything. And you also saw the reason the U.S. was able to get the Inflation Reduction Act over the finish line was because, I mean, one reason was that Joe Manchin was concerned about China dominating supply chains. So you see their competition driving climate action and you know, the pursuit of profit and self-interest doing the same. So you know, I mentioned this before. One reason the book is so readable is because it's really about people, like all good stories are. Each chapter is about one person. My favorite might be chapter two. It's titled The Bureaucrat. Who is the bureaucrat? Uh, the bureaucrat is Wan Gang. He is, uh, was the science minister between 2009 and 2018. Um, and it was a pivotal period for China. So uh, he was born in China, uh, grew up during the Cultural Revolution, where you know, uh, Chinese people uh, from cities were sent into uh, villages to try and uh, re-engage with life as it should be. Uh, and he found himself repairing tractors and fell in love with cars. Uh, became an auto engineer, studied in Germany, got a job in Audi, rose up the ranks, and was head of production. Um, and at that time, this is the year 2000, he was receiving uh, Chinese delegates who were coming to Germany to learn about you know, how the Germans make such good cars and how can we in China make them too. Uh, and he turned around and he talked to the then science minister uh, that, look, if you want the kind of lifestyle that Germans have. They burn 16 barrels of oil per person per year. We in China in 2000 burn one barrel per person per year. And if you want that kind of lifestyle, we just don't have enough oil in the world. Plus, look at what's going to happen when you're going to get all that uh, pollution from burning oil in the cities. Um, and he said, if you want a solution, you should think about a technology that would be different, that would use a different f uh, fuel source. He wasn't sold on batteries or hydrogen. He said, but electrification is the answer. And I can work with universities and, and industry to make it happen. And so he goes back to China. He's given this advanced research program. He makes electric cars and buses with this collaborative uh, approach. Um, and show, showcases them at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the things that he'd predicted about air pollution going up, oil imports going up, were, com were coming to be true, right? Um, we now don't think about the smog in China, we think about smog in India, but the smog in China was deadly. Uh, and so he's given this mandate to try and take those early ideas and make them a big industry. Uh, alongside that, he's given a ton of subsidies to try and spur the industry to make those cars, but also the power as a science minister to put through regulations that would drive the purchase of electric cars and lithium-ion batteries. And of course, now we know it's the largest maker of electric cars, the largest maker of lithium-ion batteries, and America and Europe is worried about what the future is going to look like for their auto industries. Yeah, you say uh, correctly in the book that, that Wang Gang did more to support the rise of EVs than Elon Musk, which is interesting and true. 
Uh, you brought up the subsidies and you know, the rise of, the chi of Chinese EV exports. It's, it's a fast-moving story. A lot has changed even since you finished this book last year. Um, you, know, you have the, the European Commission doing an investigation about uh, what it calls illegal subsidies, uh, considering countervailing duties to keep Chinese cars out of Europe. The US Commerce uh, Department doing an investigation on the grounds that uh, these cars are collecting Americans' data. Where do you see the story going? You keep reporting on this. What's next in the, the battle over Chinese electric car exports? Yeah, I mean, the reaction we are seeing from governments bringing in trade barriers uh, to try and spur or protect domestic industries, the sort of protectionist era that we're not just seeing in autos, but in, in other types of industries, is one that we've seen play out previously, right? In other parts of the world, when uh, governments have wanted to have an industry grow domestically, Japan did it in, in the 90s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, America did it when Japanese cars were uh, tra starting to eat into American cars' uh, a share of, uh, of the market. Uh, and now we are starting to see that play out again. It does worry people who are squarely focused on the energy transition that this is going to mean higher cost and slower transition at a time when you actually want to speed the transition up. Uh, but it is also uh, something on governments. Uh, it's incumbent upon them that uh, the political economy of having big key industries uh, going away is not going to look good on the governments that need to have uh, the political backing of the very people as we make tougher decisions going down into the energy transition. So it's a very, very uh, fine balance that governments have to come up with. And I don't know if uh, the, the sort of protectionist policies that have been played, uh, that have been put here in Europe, uh, in, in America or in Europe, are going to work out. Um, we are already starting to see in some places that it may not be the best option. And I think if governments are agile and, and are able to tweak uh, those policies so that it actually works, maybe it does. It's certainly a tricky question for people focused on emissions. You know, I think there are justifiable reasons for uh, those sorts of restrictions. I mean, you know, the political economy matters. People want to, don't want to switch to technologies that are only made by geopolitical competitors. But you can imagine uh, an American going on vacation to Mexico and they're taxi driver picks him up in a $11,000 uh, car, a BYD taxi that costs $11,000. And like, what is this? And why can't I buy one? Uh, it might be a bit more like TikTok than, than some other <laughs> things. Um, move to chapter four, another interesting character in the book. It's full of interesting ones. Who is the doer? So the doer is Sumant Sinha. He's uh, the CEO of a company called Renew, which is one of the largest renewable energy companies in India. And his story to me was interesting because um, you know there's often on online trolling, if you talk about uh, emissions not falling faster in America or Europe, they go, but look at India and China. They're building all those coal power plants. It's really their problem, isn't it? Uh, turns out, well, we can talk about the Chinese numbers, stunning amount of clean energy deployment, even as they are building more coal power plants. But the Indian story is a much harder one because India doesn't have the financial capacity of uh, China, let, or, let alone Europe or America. And so how do you scale up a technology which is becoming, or at least at when, when Sumant got started, was starting to become cheap and maybe could have competed with existing uh, energy resources. But India as a place to do business wasn't good. Uh, you know, it ranked something like 110 on uh, the doing business rankings uh, globally. And so he really had to do what we in Hindi we call jugar or hustle to try and find a solution, to try and find the capital to, uh, to deploy these solutions, to try and figure out the bureaucratic uh, problems in um, not just building solar plants, but actually getting payments for the solar plants that have been built. Uh, all kinds of little things, but every, every little bit st uh, stopped progress from happening. Uh, to, to, so to see how he un, uh, undid those problems and actually built at that time, uh, it was the largest renewable energy company. But once he did that, all the other domestic players could see, all the domestic investors could see mm. that this is something that could be done. And the key to making it happen was he could bring in foreign capital. So he had uh, investors from the US, from Canada uh, come in, but also that he was able to work with government to try and showcase what kind of policies would actually work for companies, which is something uh, that doesn't happen that often in India, where the government is listening to what industry wants. Usually it's more fiat. Uh, and that combination really uh, unlocked what is uh, a pretty big success story. 
and trade protection is part of that story as well. I mean, you do see yes. restrictions in India on imported solar. Yeah, so India has sort of this uh, a similar, I mean, even with, with geographical proximity, a sort of uh, China-India uh, tension uh, have grown a little more because of, of border skirmishes. So India has been importing all its solar panels, uh, or at least uh, the, the, um, the silicon PV underneath it, uh, and then sometimes manufacturing just the modules to be able to put it up uh, on roofs uh, or, or in solar farms. But it's also wanting to build a domestic manufacturing capacity so that it will also have some amount of solar that it can make. And it's doing that through trade barriers uh, and encouraging companies like Renew Power, which are now going to build factories to make solar panels. Your book came out the same day in the US as a book by Brett Christopher. It's called The Price is Wrong, Why Capitalism Won't Save the Planet. Now, it sounds like the books are opposing. I think the titles are a bit misleading. Your book is not a call for unfettered markets, and you don't say government needs to get out the way. And Christopher's book is nuanced as well. He's basically rebutting the argument that now that renewables are cheap and level of cost of energy terms, the only obstacles are politics and permits, basically, which some people say. And he's saying, like, no, it's still, renewables are still making insufficient, unstable profits. Lenders don't like them. It's more secure with fossil fuels. There are structural factors like transmission can cost more for renewables or the sun shines at the same time for all solar panels and they cannibalize each other's profits. So that scares off lenders. Basically, finally, the question, what sort of non-price barriers to the transition did you see in your reporting for this book? Like areas where, as you say, it's cheaper to save uh, the planet than to destroy it, but still we're not seeing green solutions. Yeah, I mean, from an economist perspective, everything could be priced, and so everything's a price barrier or a price success in some way. But yeah, I mean, there are just so many things that are not that are harder to price. Uh, you know, you talked about permitting reform; it's it's an issue almost everywhere in the world, including in China. Uh, you know, we think of China as uh, a dictatorship that you know. Uh, the dictator says so it gets done. It's not true. I mean, there, there is local opposition. There are local uh, uh, companies that oppose uh, a lot of uh, uh, state intervention. So permitting reform is definitely one big barrier. Uh, the other barrier is, at least from a developing country standpoint, is technology barriers. So mm. solar and wind and batteries have now start, started to become cheap because those technologies have spread out. But what's going to happen in the future when you want hydrogen, when you want carbon removal, um, that, uh, given the experience of COVID vaccines, uh, does make a lot of developing countries uh, really nervous about how the energy transition is going to work out. Uh, I mean, the number of non-price barriers are huge. Uh, and the nice thing, though, is that because the aligning forces around wanting climate action, it's forcing governments to try and figure out where the bottlenecks and, and how to uh, undo them. I think that's right. And you sometimes also see pricing as a carrot. I mean, you see some jurisdictions in Europe sharing profits from the local wind farm with, with the village nearby, and that makes people more uh, amenable to it being installed. Uh, you talked a little bit about this in your, your answer on uh, Indian solar, but the IMF and World Bank spring meetings are coming up in D.C. later this month. You have a good section in your book explaining why the cost of capital is so important for, for renewables projects and specifically in, in countries like India. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit more about the cost of capital? So India now has some of the cheapest solar resources in the world just because it's so uh, baked with sun, has cheap labor, uh, and is okay to, to some extent to have cheap Chinese solar panels. But it's still not deploying solar at quite the pace that it needs to, and capital still ten, tends to be a big problem. So just some rough numbers, these are not precise uh, tied to a project, but if you were to go out to a bank in India and try to uh, get a loan for a solar farm, you're going to be paying interest rates from 12 to 15%. Uh, whereas you try to do it even in this high-priced environment in the US or in Europe, you know, uh, you might get seven to eight percent. That's just a big gap in just the sheer interest rate that you have to pay. And these are a lot of the clean energy solutions are upfront cost, which means that that cost of capital hurts even more because you have to have that large capital early on in the game and it'll pay off over over a long term. Um, and so, you know, the book is a case study of many success stories that are working. There are so many things that are still not working, mm -hmm. and one of them is how do you unlock 
trillions of dollars of investments from rich countries going into developing countries because that's where the biggest gap on climate solutions currently is. And the, uh, the spring meetings that are happening uh, later this month will start to grapple with those issues. We might see some news uh, around uh, some forms of reforms that are uh, going to happen, but it will be a long, long run uh, process uh, because those are bureaucratic organizations that don't change that quickly. And that's why it's such a shame that so many governments started taking emissions reductions more seriously just as a decade of cheap money came to an end. It's really bad timing. Um, better late than never. The book is titled Climate Capitalism, and some readers may say, capitalism, wait, we're, talking, we're jumping from India to China to the EU to the US. Are these places all capitalist? Um, I think so. I mean, if you think about what China is, it really is uh, state-driven capitalism, right? So the electric car story that I talked about where tens of billions of dollars were invested in subsidies, well, that attracted hundreds of billions of dollars in private capital into just the EV and lithium-ion manufacturing. Uh, and so, you know, state providing policy incentives to build and uh, regulatory uh, structure to try and increase the market share of a particular product, those are places which make for, with certainty, attractive business proposition. And so private capital moves in the direction where you provide a, a clear opportunity for returns to be made. Um, so, you know, the, but the Chinese form of capitalism is different because it wasn't aimed at reducing emissions, it was aimed at creating a domestic industry for domestic consumption first, and then perhaps get into the export market, and that's what's happening with lithium-ion batteries and EVs now. Uh, the you know, American uh, climate capitalism is different because you don't have, you have a divided politics here. One party believes in uh, climate action, the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so you're getting the Inflation Reduction Act, which is very subsidy driven, which is about tax credits. It's about incentivizing industry to do um, the best it can on, on deploying clean energy, but no real sticks uh, to drive, uh, drive those solutions. In Euro Europe, you get the other version. There's some amount of subsidies, but really it's more about direction. It's about giving clear signals to the market and clear definitions about what kind of investments count for what, and of course, legally binding targets that need to be met. And the Indian capitalism, uh, climate capitalism, is different because it just doesn't have the financial capacity to be able to do subsidies in a large way, and it doesn't have the, the government bureaucracy yet to be able to effectively uh, enforce policies. Uh, and so you're getting uh, you know, a patchwork of solutions. So solar is working, uh, but other solutions like hydrogen or electric cars haven't really taken off in India. Yeah, when you can't regulate, you use a tax code, and when you can't spend, you regulate. I like how, what you say in the book of, about different flavors of capitalism. Um, and on the China point, I mean, you do see really intense competition among companies within China, like EV brands that appear one day and seem to be gone the next. So there's, there's competition there, and there's, there's market pressure. There were, them. at one point, 450 EV companies in China, <laughs> and they've slowly consolidated, but that's what competition gives you. When I was there, there seemed to be some that their logos are basically like copies of German car companies, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, just to make you feel like it was something solid. Um, you have a chapter about uh, Unilever as well, uh, the multinational firm that makes, I don't know, shampoo and makeup and all sorts of things, ice cream. Uh, they have very ambitious climate goals, but you've recently reported that Unilever is under pressure, for, under pressure from investors who say they're getting distracted by these non-financial objectives. So yeah. what's happening? Are they able to prioritize net zero over... Uh, their obligation to maximize shareholder value? Yeah, so I chart the uh, decade in which Paul Pullman was the CEO of Unilever and uh, sort of showed uh, how big corporations can actually start to think about climate action. And he had very clear reasons to do it. Uh, now, think about ice creams, right? One of the hundreds of, or thousands of products that Unilever makes. Um, you would expect that in a heat wave, more ice cream would be sold. Turns out, heat waves are getting so extreme that people stay at home and fewer ice cream is sold. So you have, you have lower consumption uh, and so lower revenues uh, and thus lower profits. Then on the other side, Unilever has all these suppliers around the world, a lot of smallholder farmers uh, who are being affected by climate impacts and their productivity is falling, their supply chains are becoming more expensive. And so that is also starting to affect the bottom line. And the case that Paul Pullman made was basically climate risk is now real, it's business risk. And if you don't think about it now, it will become too expensive at some point, and that could be existential for a business. 
over the past couple of years, uh, the macroeconomic situation we've been in with high interest rates and, and other types of problems causing supply chain issues have led to financial problems at Unilever, at least on performance. Uh, and so they've run through a couple of CEOs, but one thing they still haven't changed on is their climate plan. So just last month, they put out their latest new updated climate plan, which is much more detailed, much more targeted, and they're not walking back from any of their climate goals, including reaching net zero by 2039. There's a whole culture now of following different commodities that have been affected in, in part by climate change. I mean, olive oil and, and cocoa, actually your colleagues at Bloomberg, like Javier Blas and the Adlots, uh, the Adlots duo do a lot of that. So it's an interesting new area. I just have a few more questions, so feel free to start putting your questions in the chat or, or get, get ready to raise your hand. I want to go to the end. You know, in the final chapter, you say you regrettably didn't have time or space to focus on every technology you yeah. wanted to. You know, you talk about you, you left out hydrogen, you left out alternative proteins. If you were able to add another chapter to the book today, what or who would it be about? Um, one that is yet playing out, so it's not quite there in a solution space, but uh, one person that I could perhaps profile is this guy named Avinash Prasad. He's now moved to mm -hmm. D.C., uh, but he oh, yeah. was uh, in. Uh, he was a chief economist uh, to the prime minister of Barbados. Uh, he he was born in Barbados, but then uh, spent a bunch of his time uh, in in London as uh, as a trader, doing currency and bonds, uh, and then in academia, and then in regulatory uh, environment, working on the the Basel rules, the sort of post financial crisis rules, uh, to to ensure that you know banks don't collapse again. Um, and then he turned to climate, recognizing how much Barbados was being affected, uh, not just by climate impacts, but by the financial burden that climate impacts bring. And uh, to, to the extent where the, uh, their debt payments were so high that they couldn't even provide basic services uh, to its own people. And so he made it his sort of mission to try and figure out how is it that you can unlock the, the global financial system to actually work toward climate solutions. And so one um, solution that he's currently working on is that if you are a, uh, an investor sitting in the US wanting to invest in South African solar panels, you know, you're a dollar investor, you're going to get paid in rand. Uh, in developing countries, you have currency exchange risk because they are just not as uh, well financialized as the US or Europe or China is. Uh, but you still want the investor to have certain amount of stability in the kinds of return they might get from that uh, solar farm. And so uh, he is working on uh, trying to figure out currency exchange uh, guarantee mechanisms that could perhaps be housed in the IMF or World Bank that would take one layer of risk away from these kinds of projects. And so if you can start to attack these different types of risks that add up in investing in developing countries, uh, you could really start to unlock uh, a large amount of capital. So that could have been a, that could be a, hopefully a, a chapter in a future book. Yeah, there'll be another book, don't worry. Um, <laughs> no, that's a fascinating element of the Bridgetown agenda, and it's amazing to see the impact that, you know, Mia Motley and Barbados made. And, and you know, Avinash is also an advocate for loss and damage, and I was surprised, you know, I know many people in this room were at COP28 in Dubai, didn't expect most, much from loss and damage based on how people talked about it, including John Kerry and other US policymakers a few years ago. And then there were pledges for 700 million in Dubai, which isn't uh, enough, but it's a significant amount and a real like, shift change in the debate there. Quick one, what surprised you most in your reporting for this book? That almost everywhere people are working on solutions, that the level of uh, awareness of the issue and uh, the desire to work on the issue has been growing. Uh, I mean, the number of people who get in touch by reading a story and saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm a software engineer, I'm working here, I would really like to work on the climate problem, I have no idea how I can do that, is growing. Uh, that to me was was uh, surprising as I as I uh, toured the different uh, solutions that are available, um, and that there is just a lot more um, momentum behind working on these problems, uh, even as there are all these other problems in the world that are starting to increase. So that climate is not falling down the priority of you know, what would we previously think classical problems around geopolitics, uh, just mm -hmm. eating up all the oxygen in, in government or in boardrooms, has been very interesting to watch. Last one, let's get some recommendations from the audience before we turn to the audience. You have to read a lot of books to write a good one. 
Any other climate books you want to recommend to the group? So the one that I would recommend uh, at any point is The Great Derangement by uh, Amitav mm. Ghosh. Uh, it was uh, he has a actually new book a, on, uh, he does. Poppy and Oprah. Yeah, Smoke and Ashes. Uh, that's also a really good book. Um, he's done a number of nonfiction books around, around climate, colonialism, uh, capitalism uh, that are good books. But The Great Derangement is a good uh, place to start. It's, it's a series of lectures, so you could just watch it on YouTube too. Um, and it basically makes the case that um, climate change hasn't uh, broken into literature, into culture, into writing in a way that is not science fiction. There's a lot of science fiction, climate fiction, uh, but not in, uh, uh, in a way that would enable even a bigger, broader population to appreciate the challenges that are coming our way. And that being the great derangement that we are heading towards this crisis and are not preparing ourselves on how to deal with it. I could ask you a lot more questions, but I think it's time to bring in the audience. We have a big crowd today um, in here and online. I don't know why I can't open this. Let's start with the people in the room. Just raise your hand if you have a question for Akshan. Advait? Hi. Um, oh, sweet. Thanks. Um, I'm Advait. I'm a researcher uh, writing on climate finance and working on some IRA implementation stuff here domestically. But one thing I uh, wanted to ask you about and I'm really excited to read the book and get more perspective on this, is that I know you've had the chance to talk to John Kerry and talk to institutional investors about how they see mobilizing the trillions of dollars of private capital um, towards climate solutions around the world. But how do you feel like these, like are these investors prepared to uh, take the due diligence it takes to like underwrite projects or structure them? Are they familiar with these industries? I guess what are you seeing as the barriers to actually mobilizing the trillions um, yeah. in, your, in those conversations you've had with people who are pledging their money to decarbonization, but are maybe complaining a lot about the barriers along that road. Yeah. Um, hard to generalize that question because a lot of these investors are very big, large investors that have very many things that they invest in. Uh, but if you look at uh, sort of big investors that are focused on climate investing, it sort of gives you a flavor of how to make these things work. So, uh, you know, BlackRock, $10 trillion, uh, invest in everything around the world. Um, but look at Brookfield Asset Management, um, which also invests in all kinds of things, but has a big, you know, 10 to 20% of its assets under management are uh, on climate-oriented uh, solutions. And a, about a third of those are in developing countries. So, um, you know, getting early in the game has allowed them to create sort of a niche uh, that they are now just keeping growing because investors, you know, they, they themselves have investors who want to give them money to invest in developing uh, countries for these projects. And because they've been able to show through years of success that you can do it, more capital is crowding in. So they've been able to raise some of the biggest uh, climate-oriented funds uh, over the past few years. Um, so yes, there are places and there are big investors in the billions and tens of billions of dollars who know how to do this. Uh, but that is still a very small fraction of the total uh, investor base. Uh, and so there needs to be a lot more knowledge sharing uh, uh, that needs to happen. And that's why having international institutions uh, be the places where this kind of knowledge sharing can happen is so crucial. Like one of the chapters in the book, which we didn't touch on, uh, is the reform of the International Energy Agency, which you know does policy work. So it takes sort of like, what's a policy that's working in India? How can we apply that in Nigeria? That kind of work also needs to happen in, in the private sector. Um, and it's not happening as fast as it should. Before you ask your questions, please do uh, give your name and affiliation also for the online people. I want to go to one online question because we have an interesting one here. So uh, as great as it is to learn about the things you're optimistic about, this person is curious to know what cynicisms were reinforced throughout the course of researching and writing this? Yeah, um, quite a few. I mean, corruption uh, of capitalism is, capitalism is very easy, right? The profit uh, motive uh, is, if it's taken single-mindedly, um, can take you into very wrong and dark places. Uh, a very good example played out in the 90s with what the oil and gas industry, with, with the utilities, with coal industry did to try and slow down climate action by creating disinformation uh, campaigns to try and sow doubt about climate science, which uh, you know certainly slowed down climate action by at least a decade, if not more. Uh, and so 
this is why this is, the book is called Climate Capitalism, that climate change is sort of modifying or forcing the modification of capitalism as it's existed, uh, where you need governments to have more power uh, and not be as easily corrupted by uh, the, the profit motives of certain companies, right? So that, uh, to me, has been sort of the, the cynical part that, you know, you do see that as being a, a big part of barrier to try and just rely on the, the pure, uh, pure form of capitalism that exists. Um, I would say, I mean, this is not cynicism, but the pessimism side of this is that, uh, you know, we just don't know a lot of, there are a lot of unknowns about what might happen to the climate system. So yes, it's, you know, not, we may not cross three degrees Celsius, but there may be tipping points in between now and three degrees Celsius that we may cross and we may not know for years or decades afterwards that we've crossed some of these tipping points. And that can have huge impacts and those uh, worry me a lot. Yeah, three degrees is a very, very low bar. Uh, and you see yeah. lots of areas where the um, the market is still failing. I mean, uh, plastics, I know you've reported on that recently. You can make money selling electric cars. You can't make money not selling plastic. And uh, we keep producing more and more of it, and we're not exactly sure what it's doing to the environment, but it's not good. Let's take another one from the room. Yes, please. Ken Dillon. Yeah. Ken Dillon, Sansu Press. Um, when you think about an, uh, analogs, analogies that you can make, uh, have you looked back in history, uh, uh, in American history, but in world history, and maybe looked outside of the area of energy into other kinds of catastrophes, whatever ancient catastrophes, so on. Have you done any of this, or do you see people doing this, and do you think it's a useful activity, mm -hmm. or should we be focused on present and future? Um, it's a very good question. Um, perhaps a limited answer, which is to say, I have not looked into ancient history to look at uh, catastrophes and how they've shaped. And uh, perhaps that's a decision because the modern economy is much more complicated uh, than anything that we had in ancient times, both geographically, but also uh, how interconnected those systems are. Uh, what I have looked at is uh, work that uh, uh, many academics, but perhaps Vaclav Smil uh, comes to mind as one who, who's looked at the history of energy transitions. Uh, so we went from wood to coal as, as the top energy uh, source, uh, from coal to oil, and perhaps from oil to gas uh, currently, uh, or maybe we skip from oil all the way to renewables at some point soon. Um, and what he makes the case is that if you let economics drive it, it will be a very slow transition. These uh, previous transition, energy transitions, have taken many decades, a century, typically more than a century, to actually play out. Now, we are asking for that to be accelerated many fold over the next few decades to try and move away from all fossil fuels into clean energy. Uh, and he makes the case like, look, history tells us it's just not possible. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to deal with climate impacts. Uh, and that is one that I've looked at. And I, I feel like what's missing from there is that none of those previous transitions had uh, the push from governments to try and move to a new source of clean energy. None of those previous transitions ever included, either explicitly or implicitly, the price that society pays for carbon pollution. We are starting to do that now. Uh, you know, none of those uh, uh, previous transitions had all countries, despite its weak nature, agree on one target for uh, a problem, which is the Paris Agreement. And so those are accelerants that enable the transition to f happen faster. Uh, there is no technological barrier for it to not happen. You, we have enough metals. We have uh, enough places to put uh, solar panels and wind turbines. Uh, we just have, you know, in principle, all those things. It's how fast we make it happen that's the real question. Yeah, there's reason to be pessimistic about about that. I mean, mo previous energy transitions are really energy additions. You know, even never, never burned more coal or biomass than we have today. You have some examples like. You know, there's fewer horses now than there used to be, but even things like we used to hunt whales for, for lighting oil, we don't do that, but we almost hunted them to extinction for other reasons later. So we tend to just add everything together. Um, I'm going to go to Lisho over there. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Lisho, Asia Society. Um, actually, just 
to go back to the um, U.S.-China green um, industrial competition and decoupling, um, where, where do you think this dynamic will take us um, by 2030, let's say, when it comes to the global climate uh, uh, politics and progress? So and I, I will uh, chicken out by saying, as a journalist, my job is not in prediction. Um, and so I, I tend to be more reporting and, and analyzing how, how things have played out. It's very hard to say. I don't know if I, in my reporting, I've come across uh, any of the sources having a very clear understanding of how it's going to play out. Um, you know, uh, the way the IRA has set up domestic manufacturing requirements for lithium-ion batteries and, uh, and, if, and those batteries ending up in electric cars is pretty reasonable. Uh, you know, that uh, if you actually made it happen, it might create an, an industry that you know, uh, can not leapfrog China because it's ahead right now, but at least catch up somewhat to its capabilities. Um, so that is the theory. But how does it play out in practice is very hard to predict. Right? You're already starting to see a slowdown, at least among the major automakers here in the US, uh, on pull, pulling back their, their targets on selling EVs. Uh, on wanting lower cafe standards so that they can get a little more time to be able to hit their goals. Um, and so it's, it's hard to see if it's going to be simple. But, uh, but going back to Noah's point, which is uh, we are also in some way familiar grounds now. There was a period of uh, collaboration not working and the COP system being a failure to Paris Agreement. And it felt like the world wanted to work together on a solution to back to a world where we are competing. And that's a world that I think we are much more familiar with um, than in the past. So, uh, so there are some advantages, but some disadvantages. Not, not clear how it plays out. Let's take one more from the room. Uh, you in the front now. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Emily. I'm with the Carnegie Endowment. Um, my question is, you, you really explore how industry is critical uh, to, to the transition, and you spend the exception that proves mm -hmm. the rule that stakeholders are predominantly prioritizing profits. Uh, and you mentioned Tesla. Where is Tesla on the Unilever to Exxon spectrum? Yeah. Uh, so just to finish up the question so the online audience knows, uh, the question was, uh, is Unilever the exception that proves the rule that uh, businesses are starting to prioritize profits over planet? Um, and where does Tesla fit in sort of the uh, Unilever to Exxon because those are the two comparisons on the on the spectrum of uh, uh, companies that are doing good. Um, now, Unilever, I don't think has. I mean, maybe they claim it, but at least on their financial metrics, have not prioritized profits over people. The profits are still primary. Uh, but what they are saying is that if we don't think about the non-financial part of the or, or climate risks to the profits, then eventually we won't be around as a business. So they're making an existential case for climate action rather than a case for uh, people over profit, because I don't think the capitalist structure is set up to prioritize people over profits. It's, it's set up to prioritize profits. It's the government's job to make sure that those profits are, um, uh, are made in a way that are a service to society. So I wouldn't say uh, Unilever proves the rule. What Unilever does do, though, is showcase that climate risk is business risk. Uh, and that is being replicated in other parts of the world. So a lot of the tech companies, for example, you know, they do have more capital, but are now clear front runners in how big corporations can uh, become more uh, climate uh, oriented. So um, you know, take the example of Google, for example. Uh, they have come up and recognize that just simply using renewable energy credits, which is taking your coal electron at night and buying a credit to say it's green, is not going to work in the long run. So they want to do 24-7 renewables, where they'll match the production of renewables hour by hour for their consumption. Those kinds of uh, ideas are now happening all around the world. So um, uh, there's a book uh, by a Harvard academic uh, called Reimagining Capitalism, which also goes into a, a series of, uh, of case studies, not just climate, but uh, uh, many more, where uh, those non-financial metrics are business risks. Now, where does Tesla f uh, f uh, lie on the ESG spectrum? Um, 
on ESG. So ESG is environmental social governance. Uh, these are sort of factors that uh, um, investors use to try and invest in companies that would lower the risk of uh, environmental uh, damage. Um, ESG itself is going through quite a, uh, quite a period where there's, there's, uh, there's political problems with it being called woke capitalism, but there's also just financial problems with how ESG is measured. Uh, we actually did an investigation at, at uh, Bloomberg, uh, it's called the ESG Mirage, uh, that looked at how flawed the ESG metrics are. And Tesla took that report and put it on the second page of its new sustainability report the next year saying, this is why we don't care about ESG. Uh, but you know, Tesla is actually an exception in that it's producing a climate solution, but it's not doing the reporting on ESG metrics as you would expect it to. So I don't have the latest figures, but it wasn't really reporting uh, a lot of its emissions, for example, or where, where its metals were coming from, uh, or what its sort of human um, uh, resources uh, problems were. Uh, and that made it a, actually a poor ESG stock on the way financial people measured ESG. So on the climate spectrum, Tesla is obviously producing a solution that the world needs. Uh, but on the financial spectrum, it's actually a poorly rated ESG company. So that tells you something about ESG as well. People are um, increasingly drawing that connection between uh, financial regulators like the Federal Reserve should care about uh, Emissions, because it's a threat to financial stability. It doesn't matter what you think about the emissions. The one I was going to take from online is about big oil companies reacting. I think we got to Exxon. The gentleman in the second row here, you had a question? Uh, yes. So um, your book is very common. Yeah. Yeah, Malcolm Fabi uh, with Optima Biome. So your book is very optimistic, and it's, it's great to see that optimism. Uh, but the question that I have for you is, since 1992, Kyoto, we have not had a single year in which absolute emissions went down, except for the two COVID years where nobody was going anywhere. And you talk about capitalism, but when you look at the voluntary carbon markets, mm -hmm. which is the only market that's not driven by compliance, mm -hmm. it's a $2 billion market in a $100 trillion GDP global economy. Yep. So what do you think we would have to do mm -hmm to actually get real action. And when you look at the part of the carbon solution space that companies are willingly tapping into, yeah. it's small, it's mm -hmm. tiny. What are the solutions that are not price, you know, what real things can be done? Yeah, so uh, yes, emissions have only fallen two years, one during the financial crisis, 2008, and then, <laughs> Uh, during the COVID pandemic, every year, every other year they've just gone up, and absolute emissions hit a new record in 2023. Now, uh, let me answer that question in three ways. One, we just have to recognize that we live now in a two-track world where emissions, as they keep going up, or even if until they reach net zero, climate impacts will keep getting worse. So, uh, you know, we are getting into a climate in unstable era uh, that humanity as a whole has never lived through. Even as that happens, climate solutions are accelerating. So that's the two-track world. Now you bring up the voluntary, the voluntary carbon, uh, carbon market, uh, the VCM. This is basically the idea where uh, corporations pay somebody in, say, Zimbabwe to protect a forest and claim that that protection of a forest allows them to erase emissions from their books. And that was considered as the best way in which you could have quick climate action because you do want to protect those forests. You do want Zimbabwe to get more money from the global economic system. And of course, we want to reduce our emissions. What has happened over the past few years, and a lot of my colleagues and I have done work around the voluntary carbon market, is that we've just found it to be broken. There is no carbon saving that is being shown by most of the projects. Like literally any project we pick up on, on the carbon offset market has lots and lots of deep flaws. So the voluntary carbon market is not working. And what we should take a lesson from that, because it's been a market that's been tried to build over the last two decades, is that voluntary markets have limits. And that's why you know, it is not a chapter in my book. I don't have a mar carbon markets chapter in the book, because it's not a success story. It's not a solution story. Um, what you do have is that if governments take the 
uh, leadership and work with uh, businesses to come up with regulations that are good, that allow for new markets being created, but allow for competition in those markets, then those solutions can scale. And so the third thing I want to say was, even as emissions have gone up, the point that Noah made, we are not heading for a four and five degree Celsius world, which we were on track for in, in the 2000s. Uh, so yes, emissions have gone up. They could have been way higher had we not got so many of the solutions that we talk about, right? Solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, electric cars. Half of the emissions pie today has scaled up solutions. The other half, which is industry and agriculture, barbecue earth, we don't have solutions for. And those are ones that we need to work on how to scale. I'm going to go to the online audience. Some, some good choices here. Question from Ralnak at the Asia Society. There's a constant tussle in governance between employing command and control measures and market instruments. In your research for this book, what did you observe about the successes and failures of these two approaches? What is the role of government? So maybe getting at this question about different flavors of capitalism and like yeah. how do we, you know, you got the CBAM in the EU and implicit carbon pricing as we like to claim in the US. Yeah, so uh, governments, you know, are by nature, they're bureaucratic and uh, they tend not to be as agile as businesses are because they don't have a single um, uh, alignment profit motive. They have to ensure that they, they meet all these other demands that people make of them. Uh, but I think what I make the case for in, in climate capitalism is that governments just need to learn to be a lot more agile in trying to figure out policy. So in, uh, in, the, in Europe, for example, uh, the rules that are being now set around, uh, you know, you could call it green taxonomy, which is sort of a, a jargony word, but basically rules to try and label things as what is green and what uh, should count as investment that would serve certain uh, priorities, certain legal targets that Europe has, um, have been a mess. So ESG or green taxonomy rules were brought in. They were too strict at one point, and businesses really couldn't uh, adapt with it. Uh, and so governments, were, governments had to go back uh, to the drawing board, come up with new rules. Uh, and we're just going to get that back and forth till we find something that works. Mm. And that actually, even as it is a failure right now, is a success story in at least showing that governments are willing to change if things are not working. And we're going to have to do that not just in sort of the investing domain, but a lot of other domains. So that sort of command and control versus having businesses flourish is going to require that, that fine balance. So you're going to go keep going back and forth. That was a tricky question and a good answer. We have time for one or maybe two more questions if everybody's quick. Uh, you have one over here. Uh, hi, Akshat. Uh, I'm Sharad, and I work in a climate team at, at a bank in DC. Can't take names. But um, <laughs> you know, my question is about uh, uh, greenwashing. Right? You talked about how Blackstone and all these big banks having big checks to write. That's that's true, but the the more I work in this area, the more I, you know, worry about greenwashing being a real problem. It is, but it's just like sorts of camouflages somewhere. Yeah, um, this is going back to the gentleman's question as well, which is that you regulation is only as good as enforcement, and so voluntary uh, contributions only go so far. There's a lot there's a lot of risk of uh, of greenwashing. A lot of the solutions that companies deploy are too complex, and the complexity allows you to make claims that uh, may sound good, but don't in reality uh, make a difference. Uh, and so we are seeing greenwashing. Um, one way to think about it is the more greenwashing you see, it is an indication that there is at least motivation, growing motivation, from companies to want to do things. But it's also a good moment to then try and bring more uh, oversight, enforcement, uh, more regulations to try and help uh, companies actually deploy solutions that do work. Um, you know, that enforcement doesn't just have to come from regulators. It can come from journalists. We do a lot of work trying to expose greenwashing. Uh, it can come from researchers. Um, you know, a lot of the universities now have sustainability programs that also look at how things are not working. Um, and so. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an interesting space to be. At least people are trying to work on a solution, even if that solution sometimes is just marketing. We have one in the back. 
Hi, Jonas Goldman, Net Zero Industrial Policy Lab. So the book's fascinating, and overall, like you know, you have this whole argument of energy substitution, right? The the global South, emerging markets, they're going to want to climb up the development curve. But I guess my question is, in all your sort of wide travelings, is technological substitution you think the only answer? People will never do cultural change, cultural shift, or is there still a role for sort of curbing consumption or cultural shift solutions? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, we are so... You want to get into degrowth in the last 30 yeah, seconds? Yeah, we can, okay. sure, sure, <laughs> why not? Uh, we are so far behind on where we need to be on goals that all solutions that are real solutions are valid solutions that should be pursued. Um, the nice thing is, if you're in, in the market of ideas, if you are convinced that you can bring about cultural change, that you can get Americans to consume less and allow Indians to consume more, all power to you, right? Carter tried that. <laughs> so it is, it is something that we should think about. I think as a species, we are consuming too much. You know, human well-being can be increased without having to grow consumption. Uh, but that kind of cultural change may take time. So if, if energy transitions of the past were slow, cultural change has been slower, uh, in, in, at least in consumption. So, um, you know, again, those are not invalid ideas or valid ideas. I just don't see the momentum for them. And to address the degrowth point, which is uh, the, the case to be made, which is developing countries grow and developed countries degrow, um, give me one place that has happened and I, I would be convinced. I would, I would go on to write a solution story looking at how degrowth works. It might be the only thing harder than using markets to cut emissions. Let's try to squeeze in one more before drinks and snacks. Actually, do any of uh, the women in the audience have questions? We've had a lot of there male a question there. Yeah, please. Hi, thanks. I'm Karine. I'm from France. I'm currently work interning at the Wilson Center. I guess my question is kind of linked to the previous one, but yeah. So I haven't read your book yet. Really much looking forward to it, but I guess your perspective is like very tech, industry, business oriented, and like trying to find ways to basically for businesses to reorient their activities, but like like trying to find climate solutions. And as you talked about, like the, the CCS is, for instance, like very debatable. Like, but so I feel like those solutions are like very profit driven, still very profit driven. And to me, they basically do not address the root cause of the problem, which is, as was mentioned, like produce less, produce differently, produce better, and consume less. So, so yes, to me, it's just I'm kind of constantly wondering, like, how could we flip the narrative, and how could we, like, yeah, shape a different narrative? So, yeah, I guess it's more of a remark than 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 a question. But like, I really see this opposition between like the those market-driven perspectives and those more radical environmentalist perspectives. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, that's all. Um, Thank you. The, I, I try and address that very early on in the book, which is if you can find a solution that is not market-driven, that is not capitalist-driven, I'm all for it. Where is it? Uh, even Noam Chomsky, you know, the famous anti-capitalist, you know, he says we just don't have the time to be able to figure out a new economic system in every country all around the world, that will also at the same time get to decarbonization. So we are just on this sort of like time-bound problem to solve. Uh, and that's why I wanted to find places where those solutions are working. They happen to be places where they are market-driven economies because that's what the world has currently. And markets do do good things, right? They are a price, uh, they are a mechanism to get a price signal. Uh, but those markets are only as good as how governments allow them to operate as markets. And so the, the case I make for it is that governments now need to recognize they do have the power, which has been you know, taken away from them in some way uh, in some parts of the world where, where uh, large corporations have shaped the instruments of government. But because people want that action, because society wants solutions, you want to use these corporations, which are good at certain things, right? Capitalistic economies with competition allow for more innovation. They allow for irrational uh, uh, entrepreneurialism, where people spend crazy amounts of time and effort trying to work on solutions that may not work, but some of them do, and then you get the next stage of development in human society. So there are good things about capitalism. How do you harness those forces to actually work for a problem? That's the, that's the book. 
Speaking of running out of time, we are all out of it. Uh, please stick around. We have drinks and snacks. Thanks for uh, making it through the rain to join us in person, and thanks for joining online. And please join me in giving a round of applause to our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, man. That was good.